Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Good Grief Festival and to the second last event of the festival. I am so delighted and honoured to be talking to the fabulous Ruby Wax. I'm Julia Samuel. I'm a psychotherapist and author. And Ruby and I are going to talk for about 45 minutes. But while we're talking, do make comments in the chat box, which is in the right hand side of your screen. And then in the last 15 minutes, Ruby loves your questions. She wants to answer your questions. So do at any time pop in your questions and Ruby will answer them um, at, for the last 15 minutes. Ruby doesn't really need an introduction. Her latest kind of star show is this wonderful book, A Mindfulness Guide to Survival. But she is a comedian, an author, a mental health advocate and a mindfulness guide, advocate, pioneer, warrior. Um, and on this trick-or-treat night, she's um, silenced her family in the doorbell to speak to us. So Ruby, Ruby I kind of, where to start? I, I think with this book you wrote in the middle of the pandemic, and I suppose the thing that comes to mind <laughs> Did you write the book that you needed most at the time and it turned out to be the book that we needed most? I, well, all of my books are because I'm interested and then I use the money to go research. It's always, <laughs> it's, it's always about me. So during the pandemic, there were questions I had and I was running my Frazzle Cafes, and, which is, uh, what do I say? It's been around for four years, but during the pandemic, during the lockdown, I took it over. So I did about 80 people a night, which is wow. a place where people can, um, well, I sort of say, speak from the heart and speak human to human rather than that cocktail party talk we usually do, you know, where we ask each other what our kids are doing. Like, we, like kind of AA, but for... Well, I use AA. Guess. Yeah, I use the model of AA, but you know, you know, Frazzle is a neurobiological word, which means stress about stress. You know, it's, and we were talking about it before, that monologue that you get that gives you the worst reviews known to man. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody, you know, we have different theme songs, but you're an asshole translates into every language. Um, and of course I write a, wrote a book about why, why we have that shattering up there, but it is a new phenomena. So um, I had that uh, going on, especially during during, I mean, I was lonely before uh, the pandemic and I, you know, change and uncertainty, those were the killers. But before the lockdown, we had distractions. So it wasn't in our face and we could keep as busy as we wanted, you know, thinking, oh my God, if I stop emailing, the world will stop. And then suddenly you're left with your fingers with nothing to do. So now we were suddenly slapped in the face with, as I call it, the big six realities. There's more, but you know, death, loneliness, um, uncertainty, dissatisfaction. And when I did Frazzle, that was the whole thing. That was all everybody was talking about because again, now they were right in our face and they were right in my face. So that's why I wrote that book as a kind of journal. You know, you can, um, nobody ever has to see it, but you can find out who you are, what your habits of thinking are, you know, how to have tools for dealing with it next time to give you a little bit of an anchor because death isn't going anywhere. You know that, but it's a it's, you know, I th think if we develop certain muscles, we certainly have a life raft to hold on to when we're smashed in the place, in the face by the next disaster, which you know is around the corner. I mean, I can, it, it, in a way, what it feels like what you're saying, or not, not just feels, what you're saying is that the volume during the pandemic, the volume was turned up. Yeah. on all our pre-existing anxieties and worries and our kind of shitty committee, which is constantly kind of attacking us. Yeah. But once with many people when they were on um, furlough or not working or certainly at home and working, people talk about it living at work rather than <laughs> working from home. They're distractions that the busyness can be an anesthetic that kind of at some level fools you into thinking mm -hmm. that you're OK or that you're important. And so people's real threats and worries about death, about existential loneliness, about change, their dissatisfaction, they increased. So I, but you heard it not just from your own mind 
but from the 80 people in your frazzle cafes every night. And so you kind of felt we all need this Bible. We need a basic tool. Is it a toolbox? It's a I'd say it's a it's a it's a toolbox, but it isn't, you know, I I studied mindfulness, but you know, it's not for everybody. It's yoga isn't for I don't see the point of tying my ankles around my head in a bow. It's not for everybody. So there is, you know, um a journaling and there are uh, which one is you, which are your habits of thinking. So if you're not into mindfulness, you know, there's, it's very cognitive therapy where you say, are you a catastrophizer? It's so good to know what um, your default mode is. You know that. So that when you sling your rage, it's not, don't blame the other person for making you feel that way. That's just your, you know, that's your recording. And we don't have to go on and on where you got the recording, but you know, knowledge is power. And it, it, there you almost see it with humor. Like, of course, I think the person who walked down the street hates me and ignored me. Of course, because that's what I always think. And you think, but other people think she was just on the phone, if that's clear. And so, it, you know, almost you befriend, you befriend those habits in a sense, because you're so used to them and you're, you know, I mean, right now I'm thinking, oh, she does, nobody's listening to me. They've probably switched off. But those, I know those recordings well, so I just sort of see them as different tracks on Spotify. Oh, yeah, that's when my mother was right. I'm an idiot. Oh, yeah, I'm not good enough for this. Julia's so much smarter. Just cover for yourself. I know those recordings well. And some of them might be true. But in the past, I thought they were all true. And then, of course, you start getting flummoxed and, uh, and hating yourself. In some, it, it, it isn't like the mindfulness stops the recording. No. Because maybe the recording we're stuck with. But what it gives you is the capacity to observe the recording and go, oh, there's that horrible yeah. old yeah. witch or that critical, you know, habit that I always have. So that you can then kind of step into the present and be in the present rather than have it completely shut you down. But I mean, what I, this is to do with the book, but it's, it's also to do with you is one of the things, and I was thinking about you and really looking forward to talking to you is that, you know, you've been very honest about your depression. You've been very honest about your own anxiety. And I was thinking about being a comedian because one of the things um, that I discovered actually not that long ago is that you can't really be angry and laugh at the same time. And you said you were hooked on rage. Mm. So was performing and being funny your only, your only way out of raging with the world? <clears throat> you know, everybody's got their own motivation. I mean, I always say Jennifer Saunders, who's a genius, is one of the dullest people. <laughs> <laughs> She'll like you for that. Could no, you? She, no, she, you know, likes to talk about mucking out the horse barn. It, 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 well, Jennifer. It's, She's not mad enough, are you saying? But, She's not bonkers I mean, enough. And um, I wouldn't say Lumley has any, uh, you know, static in her brain. So people, it, it's not necessary. And I think it's always strange what people say, you know, do comedians or performers have more mental illness than others? And I go, it's one in four who have mental illness. There's not that many funny people. <laughs> uh, in my case, I can't speak for everybody else, but when my parents would torture me when I was young. I'm and not, you say that as if it's a light thing to torture you. No, but again, I have to give it a light touch. Otherwise, everybody go, oh, she's whining. You know, oh, why okay. don't you go on the Jerry Springer show? I mean, I, I, tur I turned it into comedy. And Alan Rickman, who saved my life uh, in many Did ways, he? taught me how to do comedy. Yeah, I met him at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And he said, Did you don't do acting. You're not very good, as did the other members of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Nice. But he said, you're funny, so I'll help you. And he directed everything. I did for the next 30 years. Wow. It protected me from my parents. And when I come back to Ch from Chicago, uh, the bus stopped at the Hilton Hotel in Shepherd's Bush. He lived around the corner. So I dragged my suitcase around there. I'd stand up. This was traditional. And I would do what my parents uh, had done to me until I fell asleep. And it was so funny. You know, I could translate it quickly into comedy. So it took off the sting. And that's where I started doing it. It's like you're putting your poison into um, 
you know, I'm, I'm besieged by books about I've had mental breakdowns. I tried to eat my own pet. You know, they want, they it, want to... I don't care. But the <laughs> fact that you can make it funny um, <clears throat> is a good excuse to get it out there. And I don't really talk about mental illness anymore because now every comedian, every the opening lines are I'm bipolar. I'm suffering. I've got yeah. to say I've got cystitis because, you know, it's just used up. But when I first started, nobody talked about their depression and I didn't really want to talk about it. But I, I've said that I was outed by Comic Relief who put, kindly put a poster of me up all over London that said on it, one in four people have mental illness. Uh, one with a five, picture of you on, on, to, on the face on, of it. With a red nose without asking me. So I had to quickly write a show about mental illness because I thought, oh, they'll think it's a play rather than poor me looking like, you know, up and down the escalator. I pretended it was a show. It wasn't a show. They just outed me. So then I wrote a show and I performed it in mental institutions for two years because I thought, well, you know, if you can make a schizophrenic laugh, you're halfway to Broadway. Yeah. So I wrote the show and then it suddenly went public and it was pretty, you know, and I, and it went to theaters everywhere. I went to your show. It was okay. very powerful. It was very meaningful. And also the way the audience interacted with you. I mean, I wish we could see people in the room watching you now, because I'm sure that, because I think the thing that about you that resonates with us all, both in this book and in Frazzle, that was such an unbelievable success, is that the your honesty and your humour it touches us all because the honesty is the most universal when you're kind of saying the truth as it is, but not saying it from a kind of position of victimhood, but just as you only you can say it actually in the, in the Ruby wax way, we can recognize ourselves and see ourselves. And that is very connecting. And that is also very kind of liberating and freeing. And that's what this book feels like is that you can, you know, not believe in mindfulness, but actually you could take, like, I like the beginning thing that you had a calendar and would say what the calendar is, because you have little tiny things that are really helpful, but coloring in. Oh, yeah, well, the, the, somebody on Frazzle, if you had a calendar and you, you got some felt tips and thought, you know, obviously, whatever the colors mean to you, you know, if it's dark, you know, 10 It could be a bad mood, you yeah, know, you're feeling down. sunny. Yeah, you don't have to write down what you felt each day, but if you just take the marker and if it's a yellow day and then it's a blue day, you know, just to, as a reminder of what I always say at Frazzle, what's the internal weather conditions? And everybody gets what I'm talking about. And then you start to see, wait a minute, I thought I was just um, anxious. You know, you people hammer themselves into this little box of what describe, I'm a victim, I'm this. And when you look at the calendar and it's every color known to man, you think, wait a minute, things do fluctuate. And this is the thing, nothing changes. Of course it does. Every second, if you don't obey those thoughts, another one will be in the queue. And the liberating thing is thoughts and emotions are quite uh, transient, you know, like weather. Like the weather. Yeah. So when you look at that calendar, you go, wait a minute, I'm not, I didn't, I'm not as solid as I think I am. This feeling of my, of heartbreak that I wake up some mornings with, if I don't buy in, because a lot of times, well, I think they say that our feelings are way ahead of our, th our thoughts come on about 240 milliseconds after the feeling. That's right. So you could have indigestion and you think you're in love or, you know, you have wind and you think, oh my God, um, the world's going to end. We really, you know, we don't have enough words to cover these internal weather conditions. And so we make them up in a way, you know that. But also I think, and I think what I understand and I understood from the book is that we, we misrepresent our colors because we're so hooked on them. Yeah. So that if you do say the month of October and you do different colors, if you're honest to what you feel, you can see that you're not because we say always I'm always angry yeah, yeah. or I'm always miserable or I'm always disappointed or I'm worried. But actually, you can see that in a day you can have 50 different moods. You can have 50 different weathers. And what I got from your book is that we can be hooked also on the anxiety because we can tell ourselves that if I let go of the anxiety, who kind of who, who am I? And 
you know, if I'm if I'm not worried, if I'm unworried and relaxed, will the gods come? You know, there's some belief system beneath it, isn't there, that kind of keeps us hooked on it? I think it's every day there's we psychically dress ourselves so that we have some consistency. Oh, I was that yesterday. I've got to be that today. And that's the same thing is that um, fr also friends don't like you to change. You, you know that. So even they hate you. Uh, you know, but this is why some people don't mind being called piggy when they're 67, because, you know, that's the old school. Well, we cage ourselves and then your friends cage yourself and that's your choice. It's much safer to have a label than it is to let it go because where's your, where's the end? I mean, when you say personalities or they give you that test to say, what kind of a person are you? I'm an introvert and I'm an extrovert. It depends what second, what second you catch me in. Sometimes I'm a bitch, sometimes I'm adorable. But again, that keeps rolling too. So you're harder to pin down um, and it's scarier, but I can't, I, you know, part of the reason I stopped doing comedy is I didn't want people to come up to me on the street and just laugh. I mean, that's complimentary, but you think, whoa, my deck of cards is way thicker than that. So I thought, okay, let's go back to school. So I like that some people go, never knew I was a cop. Well, my books are funny, but they think, oh, they I are funny. I mean, this is funny because it's the way you say it. Yeah. It's the wax words, isn't it? <laughs> I'm dyslexic. And so I really wanted to make the sentence make sense, but my mind works a little like jazz. So it comes out funny. Sometimes yeah, I'm yeah. going for it, but it's just scatty. But um, I, I think that to make, uh, as, to make something palatable and to make people be able to swallow it, especially when you get dark is if you make them laugh, then their mouths are open. You could put anything in there. And I think sometimes when I do my show, I have to deserve being serious. So I'll kind of lubricate it for maybe 10 minutes. And then you slip in something quite heavy. And they and they really are open. You know, if you make somebody laugh, the weather conditions. They're not defending. Up. They're not defending and they're not offended when you do say it. Because, you know, you work for it. So when I used to interview celebrities, if they liked me, I mean, a couple of them, Donald Trump wanted to kill me. Um, it's because I work them for 10 minutes, you know, I'd um, expose, you know, show them who I was, I'd make them laugh, you have to work for it. And then you can, and then people go, okay, you've done a mental striptease, now I will. So I feel like I've been softened by you. And I'm sure the audience has. What do you, what is the tough message you want to tell us that we need to hear that we wouldn't hear? You know, our hearts are, are more open. You you mean from the book or just generally in life? Whichever, wherever you are. Where I am now is um, every time I finish a book, it, the next one starts where the last one ended. So um, I was never able to say it when I was at Oxford. I could never say the word compassion. I'd call it the C word. And I'd say like to- Like cunt. <laughs> like cunt. I couldn't say it. The word <laughs> compassion, it was just too oozy and gooey and reminded me of those greeting cards where you get with two little kitties on the front. Okay. Too yeah. too too yucky too sort of yucky. Tweet, yeah. And, Tweet, yeah. Yeah. And I'm um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's so good for your health, even if you fake it to make it. If you're if you do something kind, it doesn't matter what the motive is, you're filled with that oxytocin, that juice that is you know, the thing that makes human beings bond. And it's it's the antidote for cortisol. So I've started to do things like... Well, your frazzle cafes. I mean, that must have given you lots of... Yeah, I, that was my religion almost. It was probably what people got when they went to church originally. But I got... I feel like I'm name dropping, but they used to name drop on. the celebrity. But I got back yesterday from Athens because I, I work with refugees only because I'm so shit sick of people yibbering at dinner parties or whatever experts they're experts on what's going on with the refugees and my new thing is shut up or get off the you know get off the pot go look at it so this was um probably i don't want to use the word happy but when i was in those in the most horrific conditions Places. they touched my heart and i wanted to say i i've never been this i don't know at peace or whatever. alive 
you know this, that's your job. Sometimes you're in the storm and chaos may be around you, but suddenly you really steady down. And maybe not everybody does because people say, how could you do it? And I went, I did it because I've never felt better. Um, and maybe I'm an asshole for that. But uh, at the end of the book, it's um, be a little nicer to yourself. And that's hard, boy, that you have to exercise for that one. But part of mindfulness training is we don't go for compassion, but if you can, you know, you are the shrink to yourself. You listen to the shit show that's going on in your mind and then you breathe exercise. You, you pull it to a, a, a physical sense. And anytime you're in your body, the cortisol lowers. Now you're not going to stay in your body. It goes up again. You know, the thoughts come and yeah. then it'll go down again. Um, and that's the equivalent to doing a sit up and you don't get a six pack with one sit up. So what I loved about it at Oxford was that you could see the results of it in a brain scanner because I'm not a fluffy person. And the more you did that sit up, the stronger these bits of the brain got that will give you um, the ability to lower your cortisol and the ability to center yourself your and focus your attention. But what comes with that? And I said to my professor, I said, I can't say that word. And he said, the fact that you can sit there and listen to your thoughts and not beat the shit out of yourself, he said, that's self-compassion. And then when you realize... Um, okay, I got this garbage going on. It's not my fault. Just the garbage is up there. You realize that when somebody else is throwing their crap at you and they're furious, they're listening to their own horror show. So you don't have to take it so personally. You know, the way we speak is the way we think in our heads. So if I'm giving you grief, imagine the horror show going on up there. So that's how I interpreted compassion, meaning the same thing is going on in their mind. So it's nothing to do with you. That doesn't mean we, you know, we work like neural Wi-Fi. If you started shouting, believe me, I'd come back at you because we're not born to be, you know, I always say the reason we have more negative thoughts than positive is because back in the, you know, in the Savannah, we had to be on our toes like all animals. If we had a big smiley face, we would have been eaten. So we have a propensity to this negativity. A negative but, bias. It was just, it was just to, um, for survival reasons originally. To look for danger. But the fact that now we fill in the blanks with, oh, my God, nobody invited me to the Christmas party. Uh oh, I only have 75 followers. These are new lines we put into that feeling of threat. It's just new lines. Maybe in the early days it was, uh oh, somebody stole my oxen. But now it's, you know, it, it, we just have new reasons to be threatened. But it still is, you know, back to the predator behind us. And we have to figure out, you know, if you're abandoned, suddenly we feel isolated. That's as bad as being eaten. You, you, you know, social threat is, is the same thing as physical threat. It is so, it, as neglect is. And that we, you know, our identity, our sense of identity, it needs to both be loved and belong and to be part of the tribe. And one of the difficulties with social media is that you can expose the most intimate raw parts of you up because you want to stand out and be attractive, which you also need to do to be part of the tribe, but then you don't get it. And so you feel alienated and, and then alienated against yourself. Um, it, but as much as having a negative bias that we needed for the Savannah, what you're also saying is that we have an altruistic bias that we never survived in our communities without needing and having to be in communities, connect with each other, be kind to each other, help each other out, you know, on the Savannah Plains and now. And I think in a way what, you, what is you're surprising yourself and us is that when you're in the worst of conditions, when you're in a refugee camp in Greece, where you see more distress and misery, something happens to you where your whole system kind of slows down and you find some kind of inner calm in yourself, which when maybe you're kind of out in the streets where you live bustling with lots of people who aren't under threat, you don't feel. So there's some paradox there. Yeah. I, paradox I, I, or there's some contradiction in some ways. You'd think it would be the other it, way around that you I always stress. But I've always wanted to be around wounded people. It's my, it's where I'm comfortable. Um, 
I, because I get it, you know, their hearts are broken or they're broken. And I'm on, you know, when I toured those mental institutions, these were my people. I have never been that happy. I wasn't paid, but the gift they would give me is I'd be allowed to stay overnight. And then nursey would come with a cup and give me my medication. Julia, I don't get happier. When I was on tour sometimes in, uh, you know, doing my shows, I'd make the car stop outside the Priory because that was where the day's insurance still covered it, just so I could go in the lobby and smell it. I swear. <laughs> once you felt I, safe yeah. there. Oh, my God. You felt safe in your mind. You felt safe in your body. And somehow those places you see, feel safer. Yeah. As if it's home. And And also my parents were refugees. So I'm not saying I'm suffering now, but I have the screams of, I can't watch films about Nazis because they're living here. So when I see them, I, I get it. I mean, they're way worse off, uh, um, worse off because they were the ones that walked, but my parents were in a cargo ship. So I feel it. I feel I have a resonance with their situation. But also we know from research from, you know, as you know, from mindfulness that your your brain changes and that you have more capacity for calm and you can see it growing in your mind when you do regular meditation, even if it's only 10 minutes a day, but also through epigenetics, you are most likely born with a much higher cortisol level and stress um, uh, vulnerability than someone like me who wasn't born from parents under threat. So you could have at eight and 18 and, and now say, what's wrong with me? I'm safe. But actually, there's been an alarm going off in your head that didn't come from you. It came from your parents. And because they were under threat, they didn't have a self-soothe system that they could do on themselves or you. So between you, you were setting each other off in these kind of fire alarms between you all. So like you were all lonely strangers constantly under attack with each other and you called yourself family it was I always felt like in our breakfast nook I I was dodging bullets literally they were tossing grenades at each other um they brought so the they were living out what had happened to them grenades were thrown at them they were under they weren't people wanted to kill them murder them yeah it wasn't their imagination no no they, they weren't making this up <laughs> no they really had to run for their lives but as a kid, I just saw, you know, it, I, you're right. I heard the I heard the Nazi sirens. I still hear them. And my mother's voice was like a siren. You know, they're all spirits. Oh, my God. So, so, I can so. hardly listen. When you wake up in the morning and she's going, wake up, mom. All right. That I still hear in my head. Oh, um, my God. That yeah. is so scary. Oh, yeah. But really. I, can, I made it funny. A lot of my shows where people go, do your mother. Well, it wasn't as scary as that. I make it quite funny because everything she said was hilarious. If you if you put the rest of the gag in, yeah. I mean, she was cleaning the ceiling with a Q-tip. It was insanity. And I wrote a book a long t twenty years ago that Carrie Fisher edited, and she said your parents are almost as crazy as mine. You can't get a better review. That, that is. <laughs> you get a better review. But, but, and also, I remember someone saying, I, I don't think your parents were in a concentration camp where they they escaped. Yeah. But one of the sayings I heard, I think it was from Esther Perel, was um, they survived Auschwitz, but they died in Auschwitz. Mm. And in some way, although your parents survived the threat of Nazism and, uh, as Jews, it also killed, fundamentally destroyed something in them that destroyed everything around them or poisoned everything around them. Yeah, they didn't. I used to say to my mother, where's my family? And she never mentioned it until the very end. She said, oh yeah, you're... she was in, she burned, they burned, you know, and they this burned. was senile. And then they did that show, Who Do You Think You Are? Yeah. And go to Austria. And um, suddenly I find out that her, I don't know, some relative had a, a son called Max. Now my son's Max. They never made it out. And you see the letters of them pleading with my parents to help them. And I thought maybe my parents were went a little wild because they didn't try. But it turns out my mother was trying. And then they shut the borders. And then, of course, I found out why was I so interested in mental illness? And I go to um, Lithuania or wherever they took me to the archives. And there was a woman who says, this is your great aunt Olga. 
And she said, guess what she did? And I said, was she an actress? Because I assumed the talent had come from. <laughs> and they said, no, she was insane. And I said, well, was she an actress some of the time? And they said she was institutionalized for 30 years. I said, well, maybe there was a workshop. And then they showed me more pictures and said, what do you think Berta did? It's your great, great, great aunt. We went on for a while. I said, actress, they went, no, she was insane too. And then they took me to the insane asylums. And wow. well, they were, they were magnificent. I mean, the Austrians really knew how to build an insane asylum, but then- Do you magnificent, like in no, beautiful, or magn in like big Victorian, be big. I mean, not Victorian, but- No, they were time. beautiful. But then when the Nazis came, they experimented on the patients. Oh my God, so, You know, was give with one hand, take with the other. And then I used to say, well, I think I said in my book, the director said, it'd be really good if you could do a piece to Cameron, you could cry. And I said, you don't understand, this is my happy place. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, I mean, for people listening, were fam it was familiar, right? You were born into a madhouse. You were born yeah. into a complete madhouse where well, the intention wasn't to harm you, but you were harmed. And we all fall back on what's familiar. We And so I get, I mean, when you're with people who are really happy and calm, do you feel weird? When what? When you're with people who are really happy and calm, do you feel weird? Yeah, I feel uh, alienated. I feel alienated. And um, if they're well adjusted, I, I, I just don't know what to, because I don't know how to act that way. Um, but the minute I'm with frazzled, you know, which, which by the way, that's not therapy. It's just to speak your truth, you know. And um, could people listening now join frazzled? Could yes, they tell, them how to, tell them how to frazzledcafe.org and we have um there's hosts during the day so they're smaller groups which it originally was so you can join one of those groups or i used to do it every night now i do it tuesday nights at 5 30 and it will open there's astounding that people are that honest and when they speak their truth they don't go on and on it's interesting when you see 80 heads going yeah me too of all ages they finish after a few minutes of you know two minutes they know they spoke it and they feel, oh, I was heard. So they don't have to, and this is- Repeat themselves and say and it again and again. And then they breakout groups. And then you see them when they come out, they've met their tribe. And um, and then it, I get- And there's the, that's the belonging. And that that is the, yeah. the buffer against fear of loneliness, of death, of disconnection, of, of not being enough, is when you feel- Hurt. that you belong with other people like you, that you can see parts of yourself yeah. in the people, I guess, on the Zoom screen. Like, did you have 80 people on a Zoom screen? Sometimes or 100, but um, that's unusual. You, the smaller groups have smaller people, but it does, because there's breakout rooms and there's only four or five, then it gets intimate. But the 80, when they're in the room, I'm only holding the fort. You're not allowed to talk about the news. And we say, this is not therapy. This is just, it's like what the Quakers did or, with, you know, what we did in the Savannah, you sit around the fire and you know what I'm, what's the yeah, weather? Yeah. Speak, and then speak they, what's on your mind. Like this. And it's, some of it's horrifying and some of it's, you know, if they're very, if they've got a mental illness, we, we say they have a need help now, or we'll take them and say, here's where you can go. Because I, we're not responsible for that. No, no. This is yeah. Joe Public who really just want to say it's, it's shit. This is just shit. Or sometimes they kind of get involved. You hear somebody saying, well, you know, from last week, this is how I feel now. And you suddenly think the sun came out. Then the following week they're fucked again, but you know, it's they're weather. Out the weather, it's the weather. So how do you manage your kind of medicine for mindfulness? So take us through a ruby day can you wake do you wake up and you feel do you always wake up feeling different do you wake up feeling awful or mostly awful um so, so ang anxious stress break yeah the whole heartbreak you know, yeah ouch ouch ruby well you don't have that see to me it's like no. that my perfume no then i go and drag myself into the so do you not want to get out of bed is your first thing i want to do this yeah, I, w I wish I was ill so I could stay in here, but um, I'm not. So I, then I uh, 
So you talk to yourself. There's a voice saying, come on, get out of bed. I guess so. Yeah, I sort of hear my mother's voice. Oh, then no, I, not that voice. That not that loud. Voice. No, she's fading away. She's fading. Okay. Oh, but um, then I go and drag myself into uh, this place where, and I, I meet three times a week with just a small group and we meditate together. Now, as you said, if you do mindfulness, you could really, there's a change in the brain if you do one minute a day and everybody has, you don't have to sit on a gluten-free cushion. You could do it standing when you're waiting for things and nothing's going on. Take you don't have breath. to go to the gym because your brain is in there. You don't have to, you know, your barbells are in your head. So you can do it anywhere, but because ugh, I got my degree in it, I have depression. So I really need to tune into the weather conditions and not always because if we went blank, we'd be dead. So the thoughts are there and they come and go. But, um, but so you always so just tell me you go into your group and there's three or four of you that know each other. You kind of well, nod, but, you sit yeah. down and do you kind of literally do your omming? Or do you I, I, don't, I mean, I would say that's a Buddhist thing. This is what okay. I do at Oxford. So if you track any sensation, even if it was, let's say, listening, sound. As soon as you're plugged into that or you feel your feet on the ground or even if you had those worry beads, that's such a. Yeah. Anytime you're physical and athletes know this, too, you feel you're behind sitting on the chair, the cortisol starts to come down a little bit because you're tuned in it doesn't stay there the thoughts will drag you up again but the kindness and the thing is it's an exercise just like a sit-up you notice the thoughts and you escort it back to let's say the breathing or the sound thoughts come you bring it down gradually to the sound it's an so when you bring it down that's through your breath yeah, or if you, so you just send to yourself, I'm back in the, I'm back in my body. I feel my bum on the seat, my feet on the ground. Thought, except you're not talking. You just are now sensing. So there's a different area in the brain that activates when you're sensing and a different one activates when you're blah, blah, blah. Gu- blah, blah, blah. But when you pull it down, the thoughts are still there, but a little quieter, like a, somebody like said, a bit a radio, further behind a radio in another room. Then they get loud again. Then you just take it down. But eventually... Uh, uh, it's like your arm wrestling eventually the thoughts get so tired um there's not blank but there's they fall over they come in they're like um fireworks that sort of go out so it'll go boy are you an ass and then they're out or you know what else you didn't and they get they sort of lose their flair they, they lose their punch they lose their punch of course then it'll come in again i mean otherwise you'd go oh my god i'm in a buddha state and sometimes the thoughts are this is so unbelievable what I'm doing. I must be so evolved. Those are thoughts too. So you take those and bring it back to your breath. So it, it's the up and down that exercises that insula and the anterior cingulate, you know, those bits of the brain that get buff, like a, like a muscle. It's not a muscle, but, you know, so. But also I, we get oh. hooked on them, right? They become, so you can, un- in the same ways you, you have a pattern, you can get hooked on them. You can create a new pattern yeah. that you unhook. That you and so that and becomes your new pattern. A little bit like that. It's like taming a wild horse. And, yeah. you know, you're so when I lose Rain my, it in, I do, it'll come down much quicker. It's not like I don't have the spike. And then sometimes I can get it while I'm still after I gave the person grief. I can even say, I'm sorry. I just, I don't know. I found out I got a parking ticket. I'll even lie. But it used to be that I'd want to bump up the anger because I was so addicted. So I'd make phone calls going, and you know what else he said to me? Because, you know, the adrenaline is delicious. You feel powerful. Yeah. And then you call somebody else and bore the hell out of them going. And then, you know what he said? And all of this is, you know, the whole body goes into that. Yeah. And it becomes super, especially for somebody who hears the war sirens, you know, I get power. Then you face your heartbreak afterwards when you know that you crashed and burned all over the place. You you depleted yourself. And it's like you have a hangover from your own anger. So just to get back to a Ruby day, you do your mindfulness group that takes half an hour, an hour. Uh, 45 minutes. But when I don't have the group, I'll still do it. Or if I can't do it, I'll do it in the car or the Uber or on the tube, because if let's say you're tuning into sound, let's see, you're just listening. Even if you're on the tube, you're not trying to hear nothing. You just listen to the notes and whatever, watch the thoughts go, come back to the sound. Any sense 
It could be drinking coffee. You taste the coffee. Watch where the thoughts go like, oh my God, I have to be somewhere. Come back to the taste. It's just the up and down. That's like exactly like. Uh, it's just bringing you back to the moment, bringing you back to the present, bringing you back to the present. But I don't see it as the present. I see it as that these bits of the brain that are in charge of self-regulation um, and attention. Your amygdala. So I can't focus on things longer than I ever could before. I really could focus. Otherwise, why would I sit there in the closet doing it? <laughs> and writing a book. I mean, you wrote a book in three months. Yeah, that that was. But don't you like the ending when I lose I lose it with the publisher and start screaming at her? I All do. Mindfulness, and then I'm standing there screaming. <laughs> I'm not going to hit that deadline. <laughs> never, you're never. I love your honesty, Ruby. Oh. And I so she said no, and I lost it. And I had an earpiece hanging out of my ear with a recording of Tara Brack telling me, let go of my thoughts and be calm. As I stood up, soaking wet in my swimsuit, weeping in anger and howling. <laughs> Screw you. I don't want to hand this in today. And the last <laughs> chapter was death. So I signed up to do a mindfulness on death uh, retreat. And yeah. I thought, oh, sure. I should have let that. You should have let that. Why don't you think about that? Because retreats are really interesting. No, I love retreats. I've run lots of retreats. Oh, I I've love got retreats. To come to them. When's your next one? I'm not going to tell you. We haven't got one organized. Okay, well, when you do, I'm okay. your girl. Because death to me, well, the more we talk about it, the better it feels. You know, it's it's. You befriend it. You befriend it. Everybody's going to die except me. But um, outside of that. I like to talk about it. Do you think? I think about it. You know, I think about dying a few times a day. Uh, and what's your fear? Oh, I, I haven't pictured it. But I, I have a thing of time is, you know, like everybody probably. Short. Won't. Yeah, short. And so I have to do things that uh, I won't. In a hurry. Pay me. I won't be funny for you. Or if I love somebody. So everything's down to, uh, if you're sucking my energy, you're dead for me. It's finished. Um, well, you know that. Dead I, being the operative word. The rest of my life, tap dancing to maybe get a job or get somebody to like me that I didn't even like. <laughs> that was my that life. Was, that's a weird, that's a bad gig, that one. Making someone like you that you don't even like. But you haven't answered my question. Oh, what was that? About why are you frightened of death? What are you frightened of? Um, well, the pain the pain and also you know the ego of saying uh well I'll be forgotten you know I think well of course you'll be forgotten it's like Madame Tussauds they will melt you down and make you into somebody else then you think your children and your books and your work and your I mean there's a huge amount of ruby out there that you don't even have to open your mouth again I, you know, as a person, I feel invisible. So I don't have a, a thing of, oh, yes, I've done this. If I, if I go to another country, whatever I have, a, I've put on makeup for you. I'm you look and, gorgeous. No, well, it, there's a light on. Um, you can see through me, you know, and I was always the invisible person. So, so even as we're talking, you feel invisible. Well, I can see I look good with the makeup, but once it comes fat? off, it's invisible. And, uh, and so that's why I developed a personality. I wrote about it in the chapter about loneliness, because some things in that list. Uh, that's why I say get 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 your get it in order. Which are your biggest fears? Which is mine isn't uncertainty, but loneliness. Boy, does that ring it? Because um, the whole my whole life, you asked me why I became an entertainer. It was to do an act of revenge to all those kids that wouldn't let me be friends with them. And wouldn't ha have you on that team. No, nothing. But in some ways, you're in, in being invisible. I don't know if this is too therapy speak, and that may not even be right. You've died twice. Because if you're invisible, you're not alive. And then, then you die. Yeah, but um, because I now am going to refugee camps, and not that this is my second one, and um, working with different things that I'm going to do now because they make me feel alive. And, I, and, and, and visible. And visible. And connected. I, maybe I didn't need them before. I just needed fame or, you know, greedy things. But now I need to feel not invisible. And I only feel it when I'm around people that are as wounded as I am. 
And fame doesn't feed your soul, does it? We're going to ask ask questions no. from the audience now. Um, is mindfulness something that is easy to learn? How do you know if you're doing it right? Oh, actually, I'm doing a mindfulness course online. If you go to rubywax.net, I teach it for okay, six, great. Six, um, six lessons. Mindfulness is the easiest thing you could ever, ever learn. Uh, like saying, here's a sit up. Okay. And at first, it's really uncomfortable, like anything you practice is like you know, writing with your left hand if you're right hand yeah, that not of. fun but and if it really isn't for you the main thing is be nice to yourself and back off don't do it but um the thing is it's the consistency it's it's the consistency and once i like to explain it with science because that's what got me interested once you um get that picture in your head of what you're doing to bits of the brain it doesn't become so elusive you know you don't wave crystals or throw some angel cards i mean I worked on AbFab. That was how I made a living. I know it's a joke. And then I always say they were teaching it in Oxford and they weren't teaching witchcraft. So I thought maybe there's something to it. This it, is legit. This is science. Is uh, it's not, do not do the coloring book. There's always a shyster at the end of, you know, what's massage? It's not rubbing oil on you. So, you know, if you're going to take a course, go to the, well, go to my course or go exactly. to somebody who's got a qualification. It's like with you, people might call themselves therapists, but now you can't because you have to be a member of the, but a lot of people probably don't check it out. And well, that's Get where credited. people who are rebirthed and are dragged out of buckets by their ankles. And, oh my goodness. you know, they call themselves therapists. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Self-compassion with depression. So th this is speaking your language. When someone is gripped by depression, self-care and personal and personal well-being aren't even there as possibilities. It's a spiral of darkness. How to move forward? Uh, you know, when you're in the pits, I'm sure this person knows what that is. You can't do mindfulness. I don't think you can do therapy because you haven't got a mind. So That's you have such to an interesting answer. I think you have to wait for the devil to leave. I know when I'm in the darkness, I can't even move. Nothing my. available. Nothing. Nobody's home. This isn't, you know, it's not You're in the black place. There's nothing connecting. Nothing, nothing is moving. You're sitting, you're gormless, and you're a block of cement. That's it. So how what can, can you do it? when that happens? I wait till it, you get the right medication. If you're lucky. And boy, do you have to look for the right medication or have somebody help you because there's shysters out there. You know this. Or it's a GP. If he's not trained in psychiatry, well, why don't you go to him for dental work? So find the right medication. And then, well, depression, the reason there's a stigma is because it eventually lifts. So people think, well, then how could you have been that ill? So, you know, it's dips and then it comes, you have episodes of it. A schizophrenic is a whole nother story. You have you stopped having depressive episodes since you've been mind doing mindfulness? Um, I have to I have to be honest. Yes, but I can hear them coming. My skin changes, my hair changes, and those voices become it's like your body composition changes. The music it. it plays, and the voices aren't just the usual boy. Are you an asshole? And nobody's listening, but they become. I always say it's like if the devil had Tourette's, that's what it would sound like. It's oh, so wow. Loud. That is as bad. So and then eventually it's so loud that you just get white noise. So when you're in oh. real depression, there's no sound at all. It's no oh sound. Oh, my God, Ruby. Well, you must, you have patients who have depression. I do. And it's terrible. I mean, it's the, the agony of it. But I guess the fact that they're coming to see me, maybe they're a couple of steps above you. Maybe so I think what you're talking about maybe is when you're when them. you're absolutely in the grip of it and you can't even get help and there's nowhere to go and you're completely locked and I don't have any ability to lift your head up. I, I've never worked with anyone, you know, almost like catatonic state. You could, there's nothing to say. And so that's when you really need medication and a good psychiatrist. So I work with people as they're kind of more able to connect. Um, Self-compassion while grieving. Grief brings a lot of focus on others, such as the person who has died. What can we do to prioritize the self while our thoughts are with or about others? 
I don't really understand that. Grief brings a lot of focus on others, the person who's died. So I think what the person is, is saying is often when you're grieving, people are always talking about the sadness for the person that's died and you don't get the attention and connection that you need. Mm. So I guess my answer to What's them answer? is give yourself permission to be self-compassionate. Give yourself permission to turn to yourself and be kind to yourself and be aware of your shitty committee. Be aware of what you're saying to yourself. Be aware of your behaviours. Be aware of, you know, what are you doing with yourself? Are you, you know, if you think everything that you do, what you read, what you eat, whether you move, who you're with, yeah. um, all of that affects your mood. So do with intention things that enable you to feel kind of kinder to yourself, calmer, more connected with yourself, and then give yourself permission to have the different feelings that you have, which may be rage, that may be despair, that may be sadness that may be jealousy may be fury at the gods so because it's through allowing yourself to experience and express them that in some way you incrementally adjust to the reality that this person has died mm, that's 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 the way it is i mean there's nothing else to say when i when i gave the exercises in the book it's pretty much except I'm not talking about grief for somebody who's died. Um, it, it's to say where- but This is a different grief. This is still grief, right? You lose yourself. You've lost your connection. You're grieving for the family you wanted, that you could have had, that you never had. It's a I'm not sure the contest, but if somebody dies, you're pretty much in, in, the, in the same state when you're depressed. There's nobody at home. Yes. So you know what I'm saying? Yes. But I, 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 if, if a child, child died, I, I, I'd go on heroin. I, I would, I would, I don't know how. So I don't feel it's not my expertise to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ruby, do you love yourself now more than say 10 years ago? I hope so. And I thank you for your wise words. And so obviously this is someone who loves you. Ruby Wax. Well, only because I returned from Athens yesterday, I've never liked myself so much. <laughs> so your, your kind of basket is full of connection. Yeah, and of tomorrow call me again. But when I was there, um, I thought, you go, you go, girl. And, you know. I love that. Go, girl. You go, girl. And there was part of me going, you asshole. You're going from person to person. Oh, I did mindfulness with the young girls. And they did got you? it completely. Yeah. I have pictures of them sitting in the circle and understanding they were exercising bits of their mind. And, you know, that some of them, you know, said, boy, is this, you know, to go to sleep. And um, they did lower that cortisol. Oh, wow. Of course. I'm that not must be so crazy. moving to see that you were able to do that. And they lay down, you know, they did the body scan and let oh, me. Yeah. It was touching and they're wearing, you know, the, the thing, but they were so smart. And someone yeah. was translating to another one. And so it was kind of all ages, but, and it had to be just women because it's separate. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I could have said, I, you're doing this for your reasons, Ruby. But on the other hand, you could see, well, when I talked to people, they were so flattered that somebody took an interest in them. And wanted to hear them. They weren't invisible for that moment that no. you spoke to them. And so I thought- It wasn't just a, refu a label refugee. Uh -uh, we they were, were a person, a woman, a- yeah. And they had a story. And they had a story. And they had a story. Yeah. I did. I in in uh, my book, This Too Shall Pass, I did a case study on a refugee, a wonderful um, young woman. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Um, who is a Syrian refugee. And um, she had escaped through Greece and got to um, I can't remember what country I called it. But anyhow, it was the middle of Europe. And she hated being introduced. I don't know how that happened because my you phone turned is, it off. My phone is off. I don't know how that happened. Oh, right there, because yeah. Anyway, um, because she said when they say the word refugee, they don't see me as a person. They just see a thing they don't want that is alien, that is stepping into their country that they either pity 
or they want to kick out. Mm. Anyway, so more questions. Um, That's why I you, said, you know, get, you, go there. You know, if people are yapping on or they're thinking, oh, well, they're on the news, get off your ass and go and look. Yes, and go and do something. Just talk to them. This is from someone who returned to, for, Ruby, you, for, for someone who returned to study much later in life, I'm wondering how did you have the courage and what encouraged you to dare to go and study? You're inspiring them. Oh, well, I got kicked out of TV because I accidentally turned 50. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Sure, was, you shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. I know. I know. I regret How it. How thoughtless mistake. of you. I mean, honestly. I and I thought I looked really great that I'd get away with it. But they know it's written in the newspapers. Let me just say now, if that thing goes off again, I'll just turn it off. But I don't get how a phone call. You see, mindfulness is good in that way. In the past, I'd faint. And now okay. I'm just going, there's the phone. Take a breath. It's not in my power. Let God and let go. No, I'm doing it on purpose. I'm getting phone calls to show you how many friends I have. Yes. So I got fired from um, television, not like booted right away, but suddenly men were doing my shows. Uh, so then, annoying. And then, um, and they end up looking like elephant scrotums. You know, they could go on to 97. But I, anyway, I'm not, I don't, you don't want to end up a bitter, you know, you know who I used to be. So I, I, I it was painful, but I, I had to reinvent. So I changed identities and then went and became, I studied psychotherapy. I tell people just so I could see who was ripping me off. And I had all new friends and I carried my books and we went to the cafeteria. I mean, I had my old friend, you know, and I had a whole new identity. Yeah, and I psychotherapist my identity. identity. Now I was a psych. And by the way, I was, since me, everyone who hit menopause has become a psychotherapist. So I opened the door. Okay. Um, you were there way before all of them. Well, baby. We're 50 there. To be yeah, fair. well, now that's happening. So, um, so then I got, uh, well, I was at getting my degree for psychotherapy. I was never going to be a psychotherapist, but I just needed to move away from TV and get off my addiction to fame, which is like a drug. And that takes a while. It's like any drug. And then afterwards, I was never going to be a psychotherapist. I got too ill to finish where the voice oh. is just, so I ended up institutionalized. And I thought, well, while I'm here, um, that I'd take mindfulness. It was the last frontier. So Ed, my husband, drove me in my pajamas to listen to do a mindfulness course because it's only eight weeks. Now, I really didn't take a lot in, but I thought this is really interesting. So I, um, I got the idea. So I went to find Mark Williams, who was one of the um, professors at Oxford at BCT. And he was at Oxford and he knew I was ill. I think you could tell because I had some pine cones hanging from me and I was still wearing my pajamas. And he said, out of the kindness of his heart, I'll teach you mindfulness and not teach you, but I'll do some classes with you. So he did. And then I said, but I want to learn about the brain. And he threw that challenge and said, yeah, you'd have to get into Oxford and get your master's. And then if you give me a mission, that's my illness. I'll get it. But I'll also drive myself mad up a wall but in this case that I is a something there ruby to get a master's in oxford that is i really <laughs> don't know to, to you well i'm i'm not a smart kid but once you, you are obsessed as i was with the brain or once with show business you become fascinated so when i had my interview i said it doesn't matter if you let me in or not i'm studying this anyway well you know it's like a, a man if you say i don't need you they'll they'll chase you they'll chase you so listen, Ruby, we're coming to the end and I feel so privileged that you gave us your precious time and your wisdom and your honesty and your, your humility to kind of own what you have difficulty with and to show that from your difficulty, you've learned huge wisdom and knowledge that you've been generous enough to share with the world, with your books, with Frazzled, with this last book, with your Frazzled Cafes. And it does, I mean, there is a kind of extraordinary power of the wounded healer in a way that when, you know, the where you hurt most, you've helped others most. And there's something 
incredibly inspiring about that and heart expanding that your heartbreak has mm-hmm. led others to have their hearts healed. Oh, that's <laughs> well, that's I, a I, lovely I, thing. I need more refugees. So I'm going to go back for another fix. Yes, you go back. So people can find your book on any good bookshop. They can find you on Instagram. Where can people find you? You've got your course. Well, you go to rubywax.net. You, I can do my course. Um, I'll do uh, my course is going on and frazzlecafe.org or I am on Instagram and all that stuff because you know I'm, we, I'm on Instagram we're both on Instagram I know, I I you. know what to say okay it happens otherwise how Thank do you, you. Sell a book? How do you, book oh my other book is coming out in January the one, another one you don't stop uh how to be you no What's the name of it? Uh, oh, yeah. And now for the good news, but it's the paperback. Okay. Okay. Well, we can't wait to get that. So thank you, Ruby. Have a wonderful evening. Thank Welcome you. many more triple trick or treaters. Okay. And um, oh, I hope yeah. we'll stay in touch. Yeah. I've and got- thank you from the Good Grief Festival. And thank you to everybody who's been listening and who joined us and who asked questions and made comments. And I hope that you can go and see all the other recordings we've done. And if anything we've said has brought up issues or distress for you, go to our page of resources where you can get links to many organisations to support you. So on that note, love to everybody and good night. Night, night. Thank you for having me.